Order members, we now move to question time. And it's question time, first of all, all questions for the Minister of Finance and Personnel. And I call Stephen Agnew. Mr Agnew. Thank you, Mr Speaker. Question number one, please. Thank you, uh, Mr Speaker. Uh, members will remember that it was clearly established in court that there is no legal liability for any payment in relation to equal pay within uh, the Police Service of Northern Ireland, the Department of Justice, or indeed the Northern Ireland Office. Uh, as I have said before, I do understand the genuine feelings that people have on this matter, and I am working hard to find some way in which those feelings could be recognised. Uh, as I said when I last spoke on this issue in the Assembly, I have spoken with the Minister of Justice, uh, and officials from both of our departments have met, and I am consulting with officials to investigate if there are any possible solutions to the issue that could be considered by the Northern Ireland Executive. Mr. Agnew. Thank you, Mr. Speaker, and I thank the Minister for his answer. And he does outline that there is no legal requirement in his department, but equally in the past, there have been situations such as the Presbyterian Mutual Society, when again there has been no legal obligation, but there has been a moral obligation on the Executive to act. Does he not accept that in this case um, the inequalities that are existing within our current civil service, um, there is such a moral obligation? Well, Mr. Mr. Speaker, I don't accept that there are inequalities. If there was a a situation of uh, inequalities in respect of pay, then I would respect, uh, expect the requisite department, whether that's the Department of Justice or indeed any other departments, to come forward with uh, a case that there is an, equal, un an unequal pay situation within their department and that that should be rectified. He is right, I think, and, it's, and I think in the choice of language that I have used, I have stressed that there is, whilst there is no legal liability, and therefore it is not an equal pay issue, even though we continue to refer to it as an equal pay issue, I think there is a, a moral responsibility on me to investigate uh, opportunities, potential solutions for a recognition of, the, um, of that moral, uh, moral responsibility that may well be there. Uh, I'm not sure whether um, the member is – I appreciate that the member isn't asking me to step outside the legal responsibilities that I or executive colleagues would have, although perhaps looking at the news over the weekend, perhaps a member or a member's party, the Green Party, if it had its way, would add an extra stipulation that anybody who denies the existence of climate change shouldn't be paid any money, whether moral or legal. Di Mackay, Mr Mackay. Um, obviously, Minister, there's been a lot of to and and fro uh, in this case for, for far too long, in the opinion of many of the workers concerned. Uh, and can I ask the Minister, and he, he's, he's touched on it already, uh, how he has sought support uh, of the executive for a financial resolution in this case, and in the coming weeks and months, uh, what plans does he have to bring uh, further cases to the table? Yeah, look, I, I, I'm not sure whether I would agree with the, the language of toing and froing, but I would accept that there is perhaps a, you know, a, a frustration. I can sense that frustration in talking to some members of staff who would be affected by, by this issue. Uh, I can certainly see it in correspondence that I receive uh, from them, uh, as well as talking face to face to them. Um, in terms of seeking uh, executive agreement on it, I have sought at this stage uh, to um, engage directly with the Minister of Justice, uh, who would obviously, in terms of responsibility for members of staff, Mr. Speaker, have the greater responsibility in terms of the volume of, of staff and seek to have uh, a solution that he and I can come forward with and he and I agree on. And I think the next step, natural step after that is to go to the executive, uh, seek agreement there, and then hopefully. Uh, deal with the issue as a result of that. And I'm sure the member would appreciate that, you know, given the circumstances, executive approval and cross-party approval is essential. And in that respect, I would hope that the member's party and indeed all parties who are represented in the executive will, if and when the Minister of Justice can, and I can bring forward uh, a solution to recognise the moral uh, responsibility, I think it is there, um, that it gets full support from right across the executive. Sammy Wilson. Mr Wilson. Is a minister like me astounded at the brazen affront right of the last question from the member for Sinn Féin, who on one hand calls for additional money to be spent on equal pay settlements for those in the PSNI, while at the same time that party is squandering £5 million a month, which could be used to make payment, but they would prefer to give it back to the government of Westminster. Mr. Speaker, can I, can I thank the member for, for his very pertinent question? He is, he is, he is, he is absolutely right. He is absolutely right. Uh, you know, there is, and it's not, the, it's not the first time in this, in this last week, it won't be the last time, I'm sure, today, that members opposite will impress upon me to make finance available for all sorts of projects that can be funded either in their constituencies or across Northern Ireland. But, you know, 
the final, the final leg, I suppose, of a resolution to this issue of equal pay uh, for former members of the working within the or members of staff working within the justice family will, of course, be if we can devise a solution, will be the, the need to find some money to pay for that solution. And you know, Mr. Speaker, you will know that there, I, I know where there is 15 million pounds that could be used not just to fund this issue but could also be given to other colleagues within the executive, people like the Minister of Health, to relieve the pressures that the health service is facing. I could give to the Minister of Education, the Minister of Education, in fact, to relieve pressures within the education budget. And right across the system, there are pressures that all ministers are facing. They speak to me regularly. They bring issues to this House. Members in this House know that bud uh, budgets within departments are under pressure. And there is £15 million that is being squandered and handed back to Westminster this year. That rises to £105 million next year and a total of a £1 billion over the next five years. That is money that we can ill afford to lose whenever it is handed back and not put to any good use at all. Mr. Speaker. Alwyn McGuinness. Mr. McGuinness. Uh, thank you, Mr. Speaker, and I thank the Minister for his answers. But I do not want to quibble with the Minister. <laughs> he, he, the Minister says that this is not uh, an equal pay issue in the legal sense, uh, and one can accept that, uh, but certainly it is an equal pay issue for those who are uh, negatively affected. Uh, would the minister uh, clarify the position that he reached with the Minister for Justice, or if indeed he did reach a position with the Minister for Justice, as to how to bring this to a happy conclusion? Yeah, yeah. I would have thought a learned gentleman like the, the member opposite would, would appreciate that it is not a legal uh, issue in respect of equal pay. It is not, strictly speaking, uh, where the liability in, in legal sense exists for the executive to, to deal with. Um, my discussions with the, um, the Justice Minister uh, have not reached a conclusion. They are still ongoing. I am happy to continue to discuss it directly with him, although officials from both departments, Mr. Speaker, continue to engage on a, on a way in which we can look at some way in which the, the moral argument could be, could be recognised. Um, I am happy to engage, continue to engage with the Minister of Justice, continue to engage with uh, at official level between officials within both departments. In fact, I'm happy to engage with anybody. In fact, later this afternoon, I'm going to engage with NIPSA in respect of this issue. I think they have a responsibility, having, having I suppose, contributed to the raising of expectations in respect of this matter over the last number of months by organising something of a campaign to call upon me and other executive ministers to solve this problem, as they say it. Uh, I think they also have a responsibility and a duty to come forward with ideas as to how this might be resolved, and I look forward to hearing that from them later this afternoon. Michael Copeland. Mr. Copeland. Um, thank you very much, uh, Mr. Speaker, and I do thank um, the Minister on this occasion for his answers. I know it is a, a difficult problem. Could, could he confirm if the, the amount of money required to settle this non-legal moral issue, which it essentially is, has been identified, and whether any sum towards that has been included in the current budget arrangements, and if so, will they be ring-fenced for the purpose for which they were intended? Thank you, Mr. Speaker. I, I welcome the members. Um, view that this is neither a simple nor straightforward matter in respect of resolving this issue, and I hope that an understanding across the House that it isn't simple or straightforward um, would um, result in some patience and some tolerance from, from members as well as from, from members of staff who are, are affected. There is no uh, set of money, ring fence set of money put aside for dealing with this issue. There, there was money set aside in the past to deal with it if it did, did indeed materialise as a legal responsibility for the executive to settle it. That money is no longer in place. It is a matter for the executive to, to look at where money for resolving this might come from if and when it decides to, to move forward on a solution. solution. But you know, our, 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 um, our job in finding that money is not made any, any more easy. In fact, it is made considerably more difficult whenever we have the squandering of £5 million a, a month on not progressing with welfare reform. Peter Weir. Mr. Weir. Uh, thank you, Mr. Speaker. Question number two. Thank you, Member, for, for his question, Mr. Speaker. Uh, in its role supporting the Procurement Board, Central Procurement Directorate has made significant progress in improving public procurement processes by making them less bureaucratic and more SME friendly. A number of improvements have been put in place, such as the publication of guidance notes on how to overcome barriers which may prevent local businesses and companies accessing procurement opportunities, making tendering opportunities easily available via a single portal, and simplifying the procurement process for lower value procurements which are not subject to the same level of European legislation. 
Uh, working closely with construction and business representatives, further areas um, being addressed include standardisation of tender documentation in terms and conditions of contract, the setting of qualification requirements at levels which are proportionate to the contract, and introducing project bank accounts for construction contracts. Uh, these measures, many of which address the recommendations arising from the Finance Committee's inquiry on public procurement, are making it easier for Northern Ireland suppliers to participate in tendering opportunities. I look now to executive colleagues to ensure that their departments and arm's length bodies implement these improvements with help and guidance from CPD. Mr. Weir. Uh, thank the Minister for the responses given so far. Can I ask the Minister to outline um, what work has, has gone on between uh, between CPD, the Central Procurement Division, and business organisations uh, with the aim of improving procurement processes? I, I think it's, it's very important, Mr Speaker, that uh, Central Procurement Directorate and me as a minister responsible for, for public procurement policy in Northern Ireland do listen uh, to concerns or indeed positive suggestions put forward by representatives of particularly the construction industry but right across business in, in general. And, you know, my, my predecessor had a very much an open door policy and I've, I've continue that in respect of encouraging people who have issues around public procurement to come forward, raise those issues directly with me or with CPD. And what they will find as a result of that is that there will be, we'll not be found wanting in coming forward with solutions where and when we can do that. So CPD has been working very closely alongside industry to, to address problems that they have raised with us. Uh, for example, we, we have been working very closely with the CBI, focusing on reducing bidding costs, improving consistency across COPEs, uh, reducing information demands and tenders and standardisation of document, documents. Um, and the outcomes in this work were publicised at a procurement, uh, public procurement conference that I attended at the end of January with the construction industry specifically. We've been working on developments in construction procurement, uh, the most recent of which are the standardisation of pre-qualification questionnaires and the development of project bank accounts. Uh, and we've also been looking, working with business uh, on the dissemination of public procurement policy and review of the delivery of procurements across business sectors. So I, I very much support joint working between business and government in respect of improving procurement because it is so important to uh, developing and growing the Northern Ireland economy. Raymond McCartney. Mr McCartney. Jeremy Ogret, uh, I can call Ogret Speaker, Slash and Eric. Thank you very much, Mr Speaker, and can I thank the Minister for his answer. In light of, of some of the suggestions or some of the, the procedures in place, would the Minister consider a review specifically? There are, there are contracts which are less than £10,000, yet when the, the tenders are expected, they have an income of £2 million, and, and many small businesses in particular feel that they are not in the range of, of earning £2 million, but they're actually ruled out for tenders less than £10 million. Would you consider a specific review on those type of instances? Well, there, there are, as a member will know, Mr Speaker, um, procurement is a heavily regulated uh, area of work, um, not least from the sort of European directives that, that are handed down through national government and we have to implement here at regional government level in Stormont. Now, there does seem to be uh, positive progress in respect of the new set of EU procurement directives that seem to be a little bit more responsive and reflective of some of the criticisms that not just Northern Ireland, not just the United Kingdom or Ireland, but the whole of, of Europe have been levelling towards um, uh, procurement across the European Union. And one of the issues that I think they're, they're specifically wanting to look at to assist small businesses is the turnover cap uh, that prevents buyers from uh, setting turnover requirements at, at more than twice the contract value. I mean, I think we have, I can recall cases in the past where the likes of requirements for, say, insurance or indemnity insurance were unnecessarily high and above and beyond what many small firms could, could tender for. And I think we have always got to be mindful in public procurement without trying to twist or bend the rules in any way um, that our economy is dominated by very small and very micro businesses. And as we want to encourage them to avail of public procurement opportunities, that we don't set barriers of whatever nature far, far too high that they're never going to surpass. So it's an area that we're, we're mindful of, it's an area where we have taken some action, and it's an area I hope that the new EU procurement directives assist us in taking further action. Bartle McRae. Mr McRae. Speaker, um, would the Minister care to comment on the impact that year-end flexibility, or the lack of it, has on the public procurement process, and whether the public get value for money? Well, year-end flexibility. I, I, I hear this, this criticism quite regularly, in fact, from uh, other executive ministers, that the lack of having end-year flexibility doesn't allow them, particularly on the capital side of things, Mr. Speaker, to plan sufficiently far in advance. And, you know, the old, we all are aware of the old criticism that sort of year-end expenditure isn't necessarily of the same value as stuff that is planned further in advance. The problem is that we, we, we work, Mr. Speaker, within the, the rules that the Treasury set for us. 
uh, and they don't allow us to have any more end year. It's not called end year flexibility anymore. It's the, the budget exchange scheme. And in respect of capital um, follow uh, uh, carry over into the next year, we have a maximum of £10 million for the entirety of the executive's capital budget. That's out of a budget of over a billion pounds in terms of capital spent. So the member in the House will appreciate that's a very, very small amount of money that we can carry forward, and it doesn't permit us to give any one department or one business area a total and complete flexibility in terms of what it can carry forward. But I do accept that you know, in many examples, and I've, I've spoken, as I say, to some colleagues about this, there are business areas where not having the ability to carry forward money into another year doesn't allow them to plan their capital expenditure with a sort of degree of certainty, and I have to say, strategic nature that they would want to have. Alec Maskey, Mr. Maskey. I get Colin Kuala Kesti over to three, please. Uh, number three, please. Uh, thank you, Mr. Speaker. For all government contracts, uh, CPD guidance includes a number of measures aimed at ensuring prompt payment to subcontractors. These include payments by main contractors to be made within 30 days, monthly reporting by main contractors and payments to subcontractors where the subcontract value exceeds 1% of the total contract or £10,000, payment issues to be a standing agenda item for project meetings, random checking by project managers to ensure that subcontractors have received payments due, and exclusion of contractors from tender opportunities for a year if they do not comply with contract conditions relating to prompt payment. Uh, in addition, my department has introduced project bank accounts uh, in appropriate construction work contracts, which help to accelerate uh, payments to subcontractors and protect payments in the event of the main contractor's insolvency. Uh, payment is made simultaneously to both the main contractor and its subcontractors, usually within five days of funds being deposited within the project bank account. Alec Maskey. Mr. Maskey. Well, I get that control. Can I thank you, Minister, for that response. And could I say to the Minister, could I ask the Minister to comment on the fact that many in the construction industry, for example, would say that some of the difficulties they would find lie more in the period between the submission of invoices and actual payment? And could I then, uh, would the Minister then give you some insight into how that particular element of the process could be uh, expedited to make sure the targets are not flawed and, in fact, are met? Yeah. I accept that, you know, even though we have put in uh, quite a significant raft of measures to um, respond and the way that we, you know, we want to from a public policy perspective as, as responsible contractors do or uh, responsible uh, buyers make sure that the sort of standards that we put upon ourselves and the member will be familiar with the fact that we aim as a government to pay all of our invoices within uh, 10 working days and not the 30 days that we have put upon contractors and obviously there needs to be a little bit more time because of the nature of, of the sort of work uh, that there is there. And I appreciate that sometimes you know, in invoicing uh, there, there is a lapse between invoicing and payment but we have um, issued guidance that, in, that two departments, including my own department, that where we are developing contractors, particularly those with a significant volume of some contracting, that a condition of the contract is that it is paid within, within 30 days. Now, occasionally there will be circumstances where the invoice that's submitted isn't an accurate invoice, and perhaps the main contractor will want to test that and make sure that everything that is being asked for is included and our work has been done. Um, but generally and by and large, everything should be easily paid within, within 30 days. And certainly, uh, as a government, we are, we are endeavouring to pay everything in the project bank accounts, will I think certainly help in, in easing out some of these problems, particularly in large construction projects. Ian McRae. Mr. McRae. Thank you, Mr. Mr. Speaker. The Minister will be aware that the Health Minister raised the, the need for a project bank account to be included in the um, training college at Desert Crete. Can the Minister um, maybe outline how he feels the importance of project bank accounts are to ensure the, the quick payment of, of monies to um, the, the subcontractors? Yeah, I, I think they're in, incredibly an incredibly valuable uh, innovation. We're the first part of the United Kingdom to introduce project bank accounts, and I wouldn't be surprised if, if other jurisdictions in the United Kingdom uh, follow suit very quickly. Uh, I think the Health Minister was right, and I paid tribute to him at the time, and I would do so again now to ensure that a, a project bank account be included for the work at Desert Crete in the member's constituency because of, I think, legitimate concerns that he had based on previous experience um, within his sector about payment and trickling down to, to subcontractors. So from January of, of, of last year, 2013, project bank accounts have been introduced into the con contract conditions for government construction contracts let by, by my department, um, where such contracts have an estimated value of £1 million and contain a significant subcontracting element. CPD has now, now let two construction works contracts, which include the use of a PBA. They are a, a new regional office for a rivers agency in OMA at a cost of £1.13 
million, and the new uh, refurbishment of the Jobs and Benefits Office in, in FOIL at a cost of £1.04 million. Uh, and we have also prepared guidance for the application of project bank accounts in all construction contracts. And this will be considered by the Procurement Board for its adoption as Northern Ireland public procurement policy to ensure that it is applied by all departments in the future. Dominic Bradley. Mr. Bradley. Um, can I ask the Minister um, what uh, monitoring process he has uh, in place to ensure the effectiveness of the measures that he has outlined earlier on, and are there any statistics available currently? There, there are no. Uh, I've, I've certainly no uh, current figures, but I can uh, attempt to furnish the member as quickly as possible with some data in respect of that. I'd be interested in, in fact, in seeing that myself. Um, as a member will know, there are reg regular project meetings that go on, particularly with, with big construction contracts, uh, just to, to, to measure and keep a, keep an awareness of, of all various aspects around a, a contract and. We have now issued guidance which is intended for all departments to ensure that uh, as a, a standard item on the agenda of those project meetings, as well as talking about you know, whether the contract is on time, to, you know, on, on course to be finished on time, and any issues that have arisen over the course of, a, of the work on a project, that actually payment issues are put on the, the uh, agenda item as well. And that allows uh, officials from whether it be my department or other ministers' departments and their arms length bodies to keep uh, to bear down on contractors to ensure that they are adhering to the, uh, the very strict and very firm conditions that we are setting in terms of prompt payment. Jonathan Craig. Mr Craig. Question number four, Mr Speaker. Thank the, uh, continuing the theme, I suppose, and thank the member for, for his question. There is no doubt that our economy is beginning to show signs of recovery. Uh, we've had some encouraging indications that we are beginning to emerge from what has been the deepest and most protracted recession in, in living memory. The latest Northern Ireland Construction Bulletin shows that the total volume of construction output here increased by some 2.4 per cent in quarter three of 13-14 compared to quarter two. The Northern Ireland construction industry has demonstrated great versatility and resilience with many firms winning major projects in Great Britain and beyond. A number of larger local construction firms have indicated that over 50 per cent of their turnover comes from projects located outside Northern Ireland. The ability of local firms to compete and win work outside Northern Ireland is evidence of the quality of the construction industry in Northern Ireland, and this gives me confidence in the future outlook for the industry. Craig. Thank you, Mr. Speaker, and I thank the Minister for that answer. Could he outline what government has done in particular not only to stabilise but assist the recovery of the construction sector? Well, Mr. Speaker, I, I think the, the thing that we have done most and perhaps best is uh, continue to invest in infrastructure um, right across Northern Ireland. Um, we have, on one hand, we have, we have assisted the construction industry by at least attempting to simplify and streamline the procurement process in some of the ways that I have outlined previously in response to other questions, uh, and that has helped to reduce costs to both the industry and, of course, most importantly, to the public bodies themselves. Uh, and this has maximised the funding available for construction works and minimise delays in getting schemes to, to be brought forward. I think there is still considerable work to be done in respect of speeding up our procurement process for major capital projects, and that is why I have asked the Procurement Board to carry out a, a very targeted piece of work in that regard. But the, I think the, the biggest area is where we are um, spending money on construction works, and adjusted for inflation, we are now spending uh, at the same level as it was prior to the 2007 uh, credit crunch and downturn. Proportionately, public sector investment in construction, which prior to 2007 was just below 40 per cent of total investment, is now at 54 per cent of total spend, uh, which I think is, is testimony to the continued investment that we as a government are putting in, but also does show I think, the extent of the collapse in spending by the private sector, and this is very much more a private sector problem, but I can assure members that all available capital monies are being spent and any surplus funding is being diverted into much needed schemes through the monitoring round process. Phil Flanagan. The, the, the Minister's figure of 54 per cent of spending in the construction se sector indicates how important public sector expenditure is, and that brings me on to the, the ISNI portal, uh, which is used to highlight what projects there are for contractors. But some contractors highlight that it isn't as good as it could be. They do accept it's a good principle. Um, but, for example, um, there are some projects that aren't on there yet. Um, uh, can, the minister, member to come to question. can the Minister um, ensure that his department and other departments use this portal effectively to benefit local construction companies? Yeah. Well, the, mem the member makes a very good point, actually, uh, Mr. Speaker, in respect of the, the portal, which I think is a delivery tracking system that uh, ISNI or the SIB run on behalf of the, of the entire executive. Obviously, the SIB's work is a, a response ministerial responsibility for the First Minister and, and Deputy First Minister, but it, it does have the potential uh, um, to 
be the answer to the problem that the member identifies, which is a, a lack of clarity about the pipeline in respect of capital investment moving forward. And you know, listening to people within the construction industry who are saying yes, you know, taking up opportunities outside of Northern Ireland for work, but are starting to see some, uh, particularly on the private sector side, some, some pick up and work here in Northern Ireland. They still want to do public sector work, and we want them to do public sector work in Northern Ireland. But as they are meeting other pressures elsewhere and they have to skill, uh, skill up and tool up uh, in, in well in advance for, for projects, they need to have good information. I think the uh, delivery tracking system could and should be able to do that. The problem, as a member has identified, is not all departments have actually availed of the data tracking system. So there are some departments whose work uh, isn't on the delivery tracking system at all. And then there are other departments who sporadically put the information up on it. So you're getting a, a very much an incomplete picture for uh, people within the construction industry. I think that if we want and if we're serious as an executive about giving good and timely information to people within the construction sector, I think here is a, a device that we, should, we can do it. We could all do it within a week if we wanted to. Uh, and I think there is no reason why departments shouldn't be looking at it. Although I have asked, as I mentioned in response to the, the previous question, the Procurement Board to look at this issue and other related issues uh, as part of their review of uh, procurement of major capital projects in Northern Ireland. Sam Gardner. Mr Gardner. Uh, Minister, there are still significant delays in many capital, capital projects uh, from government hitting the ground. Can you, uh, what can be done to improve the situation that we find ourselves in? Well, of course, Mr Speaker, one of the biggest capital projects not to proceed uh, over the last couple of years was the A5 uh, road project, um, which, of course, the Minister for, for Regional Development, Danny Kennedy, was responsible for and, and, and wasn't, uh, fell foul of the, the courts in terms of the, the process uh, leading to, towards that actually materialising on the ground. So I think there are, there are lessons for, for all of us to learn from that. One of the lessons that I hope that we learn, and again it's something that I hope the Procurement Board looks at, or the subgroup of the Procurement Board looks at closely, is creating a pipeline of work um, so that whenever a situation such as the A5 where a significant amount of money couldn't proceed, it was a, you know, roughly $100 million um, last year and $115 million this year couldn't be spent in that project, that there are sufficient volume of projects that have advanced to a stage where they can avail of that, that funding if and when it materialises. Obviously, we hope that sort of situation has happened with the A5 doesn't happen again and that all major capital projects that we want to deliver are delivered. But as we know, whether it's planning or falling foul of the courts, as, as, as Minister Kennedy did in respect of the A5, that there are other opportunities to soak up that money. Because if we don't have an opportunity to soak up that money, then the funding will be lost in Northern Ireland and our people will lose out as a result. Karen McEvitt. Speaker, question five. I thank the member for a question. Mr. Speaker, I am very happy to say that with my approval, officials from my department are currently in the process of negotiating the settlement terms and processes for payment with NIPSA for those former staff represented by the trade union who lodged writs in court following a change last year to the legal position regarding the time frame within which former staff can lodge equal pay claims. Affected former staff represented by NIPSA will be contacted soon. Once these processes have been agreed and payment for this group of staff are underway, officials will contact other former staff who could bring a claim and seek to settle it, uh, with them in the same way. A supplementary on that uh, good news this afternoon, uh, Mr Speaker. I wasn't expecting it, uh, but could the Minister uh, advise the House of a time frame and how many uh, staff this um, affects? That's a very rare piece of good news around this place, but uh, I'm very happy to, to bring it nonetheless. Um, in terms of the quantum of staff, it's, it's, I think it's around about 1,200 staff who will be, be affected by this. Uh, and obviously, we're, we're very, very keen to progress this as, as quickly as, as possible. As I say, we've already started discussing um, this with, um, uh, to, uh, with officials from, from the union to try to get it transacted as, as quickly as possible. But it is, as a member will appreciate, given the volume of staff, given the amount of money, which is going to be around £2 million, which is going to pay it out to the, the affected individuals, it will take some time to process not just the issue in terms of the pay that there is outstanding, but also the ramifications that it has for, for their pensions. Sydney Anderson. I thank the Minister for his responses. Can I ask the Minister if finance was to be made available to settle the equal pay issue? Will the estate of those staff who have died also receive that payment? I thank uh, Mr Speaker, the member for his question. It's, a, it's an important issue and, and the answer is, again, good news, yes. Uh, officials will um, uh, contact the estates of staff who have died and make a payment to the estate of the deceased member of staff. Members, that concludes all questions to the Minister of Finance. We now move to topical questions to the Minister, and I call Fry McCann.
Mr. McCann. Would the Minister confirm that the SD has estimated 450 million would come out of the local economy of welfare reform was to be implemented? Yeah, I, I'm not particularly versed in what the precise estimate that uh, DSD has made of what will come out of, of the economy in terms of, uh, as a result of welfare reform. Um, but the member will know now that, uh, as I've made perfectly clear, not just in uh, responses to earlier questions, but um, as I've made very publicly known within the media and indeed in this House last week, that any impact that it has, and of course there are many people in Northern Ireland who will who will benefit from welfare reform as a result of the move to universal credit. A significant number of people will be, will be better off, but I do appreciate that, there are, there, as there are with any changes in any reforms, there are always winners and there are always losers. But the member will appreciate, Mr Speaker, I hope that um, we now have to balance the impact of, in terms of the money that is lost as a result of welfare reform uh, with the money that will be a significant amount of money that will be lost to the Northern Ireland economy and our ability as an executive, our ability as, a, as a, an assembly to spend on public services that are needed by our citizens. And I, and I know the member, I mean, the member and I go back a long time in respect of looking at welfare reforms. We can remember the previous set of welfare reforms, which were a bit of a teddy bear's picnic in comparison with some of the, the current ones. But you know, he will have to appreciate, as I'm sure others will appreciate, that the impact in terms of reducing, taking £1 billion pounds out of our budget over the next five years will be to affect some very, very seriously vulnerable people within the Northern Ireland, uh, Northern Ireland society. That isn't taking into account then the impact of the cost of a replacement IT system, because if we step away from parity with the rest of the United Kingdom, we're going to have to replace that, and the costs are estimated at around £1.6 billion pounds over the next 10 years. And then there is the very real concern that even in procuring a very expensive IT system of our own, that it will take beyond 2016 to put in place. And the ramifications are for that that, are, that many, many people, including 200,000 working families in Northern Ireland, won't receive the benefits that they are entitled to post-2016. Mr. McCann. Uh, I thank the Minister uh, for, for his uh, answer thus far. Uh, and uh, the, the, the figures that, that he's just released are, are figures that I don't recognise. They've only uh, materialised over the past few weeks. But uh, the, the, they asked the question that, uh, that rather than a reform agenda, it's a cuts agenda, that the British government have all, already said uh, that they wanted a reduction of 20%. Uh, of, of, of the benefit bill, uh, that the, it's more, more likely to hit uh, uh, the, those most marginalised in society, such as low earners. And, uh, those, but would it not be better if we stood together as a house and went to the British government and said, uh, enough is enough? That the member now uh, brings uh, his remarks to a close. Enough, and uh, let's get a system that uh, uh, is beneficial Minister. to people rather than the cuts. <laughs> I think, I, think there, I think there was maybe a question in there or something. There was a, a why or a where or something. But can I, can I remind the member, too, in terms of whatever the estimates of, uh, he mentioned 450, I've seen figures of 750 put forward uh, by others, that, of course, that, that isn't the money that is taken out of the economy. That is the amount that we have, less amount that we have to spend on welfare in Northern Ireland. The overall global picture in terms of uh, welfare spending in Northern Ireland will continue to, to increase post-welfare reform. So it is actually... 450 million, if you take the member's figure that he puts out, it is 400 million, 450 million less than we might have expected, as opposed to a net loss of 450 million. And I think, thinking back to figures that I saw roughly uh, 12 months, 18 months ago, that ex welfare expenditure, social security expenditure in Northern Ireland was, was anticipated to rise towards the end of the decade by roughly 20 per cent in Northern Ireland as a result of the reductions uh, coming through from welfare reform. That will be 17 per cent. Roughly, um, but the, 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 whether, whether it's 20 per cent or 17 per cent, there will still be a net increase in welfare expenditure in Northern Ireland. There won't actually be a reduction. And then, as I said, Mr. Speaker, you've got to in a situation where, okay, it may not be nice to see that, um, that amount of money not going into the Northern Ireland economy, but we will sure as hell feel the impact of a billion pounds being taken out of our ability to spend over the next five years. And the member says that he doesn't recognise the figures that I've put out. Well, he will start to recognise those figures when we see cuts to every single department within this executive. Every single department. M Mr Speaker, I will have, I will have no, option, no option but to bring forward a paper next year to executive colleagues outlining how I think best that we should be reducing our expenditure across all departments by £105 million next year. And I really don't look forward to, in a few years' time, taking over £300 million, £300 million being taken out 
of expenditure by departments here in Northern Ireland. And the impact of that will be, will be hit, hitting the very, very vulnerable people that I, I actually believe the member is trying to protect. But those same vulnerable people will be impacted exceptionally negatively by cuts in housing and health and education and elsewhere. Chris Hazard. Mr Hazard. Following the Minister's revelation, the agri-food loan scheme should reopen early in the financial year. Can the Minister provide clarity on when exactly this will re reopen for applications, given the significance of this to our local industry? Yeah, look, there's work, work is ongoing. I wouldn't necessarily describe it as a, as a revelation. Um, it was pretty clearly outlined to executive colleagues in the uh, January monitoring paper. Uh, it was raised specifically by me. It wasn't hidden away in any way. It was raised specifically in the House whenever I brought the January monitoring paper forward. Uh, and I think the member would appreciate it. Well, look, I, I remain absolutely, totally committed to the scheme. I think the scheme is a good scheme. I think the scheme will allow us to avail of opportunities uh, within uh, UK supermarkets who are increasingly sourcing food products, from, particularly meat products, from UK farms uh, and UK producers. Uh, I think there's huge opportunities for the local sector to expand. The member will, I'm sure, appreciate that bringing together something which has government, which has banks, which has producers and has processors involved in it was complicated from the outset. And we always have to say, Mr. Uh, Speaker, anticipated that um, even if applications were made in this financial year, the bulk of, of, of spending would take place actually in the next financial year. And that's why we have already an existing commitment from back in January to uh, an additional £10 million of expenditure in the agri-food loan scheme moving forward. Work continues on it, and I hope that it will be in place in the next number of weeks, ready in time for the next financial year and people to, to avail of what I think is an excellent opportunity to expand their businesses. Mr. Hazard. I thank the, the Minister for his answer. It may not have been a revelation to the Minister, but it certainly was for a large number of people within the industry itself. Uh, can the Minister confirm if the £10 million uh, is still in place for the scheme? Yeah, look, I'm sure that there's many within the farming industry who don't listen to January monitoring statements in this House. And there's certainly a lot of members in this House who don't listen to January monitoring statements when they're, when they're brought forward, even though they're incredibly important. And yes, look, there, there's £10 million. Pounds uh, committed to, to next year. Uh, and we will judge the success of the scheme in terms of how it impacts in the poultry sector. If it's as su successful as I think it will be, then we will obviously look at additional expenditure in future years. There's money through financial transactions capital, uh, which is unallocated for future years, which could be given to the poultry sector. But we're also, of course, exploring opportunities within the pig meat sector as well. And we haven't drawn a line just under those two sectors. We will look at other opportunities too in other uh, sectors of our, of our booming agri-foods industry. Mr. Mackay. Mr. Mackay. Mr. Mackay. Mr. Mackay. Uh, can I ask the Minister what discussions he has had with NAMA uh, in the past week, uh, given the importance of their portfolio uh, to the local economy and local markets? I, I haven't had any discussions uh, this week uh, with NAMA uh, in respect of, I'm sure the member is going to refer to reports in the media, uh, and I'll preempt this as supplementary as best I can, but I've had no comments or no conversations with NAMA this week, although I do intend to uh, have a conversation early on this week. Mr. I can thank the Minister for his answer. Uh, I think, first of all, it's important to appreciate some of the commercial sensitivities around uh, this particular issue. Uh, but can I ask the Minister, can he give us some reassurance uh, that both the Executive and the Dub Dublin Government are making it quite clear uh, that the, there is a need for responsible management of the NAMA portfolio to avoid any adverse effect uh, on the local economy? Yeah, well, look, the member will have seen, and most members in the House will have seen news reports towards the tail end of last week in respect of uh, speculation about a potential buyer for the Northern Ireland portfolio. Now, it's not, um, as I understand it, it's not assets that are just in Northern Ireland. There are assets that are owned by people from Northern Ireland, so they will predominantly be within Northern Ireland, but they could also be within Great Britain or uh, the Republic or elsewhere. Uh, I think it has the potential to be something very good for Northern Ireland, and I think as we get towards the sort of the more business end of what NAMA has to do, and obviously NAMA has taken, I think, a responsible approach over the last number of years, but they are getting to the stage within their process where they're going to have to start to realise some benefit from some, some uh, money from the assets that they hold here in Northern Ireland and elsewhere. I think if an investor who has the sort of backing uh, that the investor that has been mooted within the press of around a $2 trillion fund has, uh, and will, will, I'm sure, take a longer term view in respect of those assets that NAMA holds in Northern Ireland, I think this has the potential to be something very, very good in unlocking huge potential within many of the assets that are currently locked up in NAMA. But it, it would be inappropriate to sort of, uh, and absolutely, uh, utterly inappropriate for me to discuss the merits or otherwise of particular bids with, with, with NAMA. Um, but we do have a, obviously an interest in what happens to those assets. 
uh, we have, from right from the outset in the institution of NAMA, encouraged them not to go down the route of a fire sale. And to be fair, they haven't. They have acted incredibly responsibly. And in fact, in some respects, they have been very good for the property market here in Northern Ireland and carefully letting some assets out in the construction sector and in, in the in housing in, and in uh, commercial properties. So, you know, I, I will continue to impress upon NAMA whenever I next, next speak to them that whatever happens with the portfolio, whether it remains within NAMA's hands or whether it goes to somebody else, that those assets are held, handled with great sensitivity and that a property market in Northern Ireland, which is showing good signs and improving gradually, isn't wounded or damaged in any way by a sale to somebody who wants to uh, earn a fast buck. Danny Canahan. Thank you very much, Mr Speaker. May I ask the Minister what his estimate of the savings which his department will require to make in the principal civil service pension scheme in 2014? I don't have. Um, I wouldn't want to give the member a guess or anything like that. So I will. I will furnish him with the, the precise figures uh, in correspondence if the member is, is content with that. Mr. Kenna. Thank you. Then I expect probably a similar answer to the supplementary. But uh, of what changes are likely to be applied to employee contributions to deliver the planned savings? Look again. I mean, obviously there are, as a result of the reforms that have recently passed through this house, which are not actually into. Uh, haven't gone through their. Uh, received royal assent yet, uh, we will um, be taking steps as all departments, as all ministers who are responsible for one of the five uh, principal schemes that, that were covered by the bill, um, will take whatever steps they see necessary to realise the savings that we all collectively as an executive have to do. There are a range of different ways in which that can be done. Obviously, there are increased contributions already hitting, hitting members of staff, but um, I, I, look, I, I would rather come back to the, the member, Mr Speaker, with some more precise um, details rather than say something foolish and wrong in the House. Cahill Boylan. Mr Boylan. Margaret, uh, Kian Corlier, could the Minister provide us with an update on the 3.2 million dormant accounts for the faith-based organisations? Gormila Margaret. The member will be aware that the, the issue of, of dormant accounts has been, been around for some time. Some cynics might say that it in itself has become dormant uh, over the last number of years. We have been develop, try, attempting to develop um, the most appropriate scheme to utilise the money that has, ha, is there for dormant accounts. I, I, as I understand it, it has increased significantly now in terms of as more money has passed the threshold of being 15 years uh, without any transactions within the bank account. It has come into the, the overall dormant account pool. Uh, my, my predecessor decided to move away from a grant-based, and I agree with the, the decision that was taken, to move away from a grant-based programme to one that would be loans to um, people within, the, uh, within various sectors who were doing work with uh, children and young people and others who are in need. Um, I hope to bring forward, I have I've had regular meetings with officials in respect of the detail of taking that forward. Um, and I hope to be in a position in the not too distant future to actually have a finalised scheme that can start to hit the ground run, um, in the not too distant future and do some very good work right across Northern Ireland. Mr. Boyle. Uh, Gorm Agat, Can Cordy Agus, Gorm Breakish, Les Nairo, Zuckter Regger. Thank you, Mr. Speaker, and thank the Minister for his answers to date. But could I ask the Minister who does he foresee that's going to administer these loans? Gorm Il Magat. Mr. Speaker, that will, that will be an issue for how we design any scheme, and that's something that is, is up for discussion in terms of uh, who would do that. I mean, my personal favourite approach to it would be that instead of government administrating, administering it and having to create a bureaucracy of our own, that we look to the market, to people who would be operating in, um, and I don't want to name any particular organisations, but there are, are several who are operating in Northern Ireland who uh, offer loans uh, uh, to people within the say, social enterprise sector, for example. I think it is important that we, we piggyback on the experience and knowledge that they have of that sector so that we can get uh, as much of all of this money and indeed probably more out into uh, very needy projects across Northern Ireland. Roy Banks. Mr Banks. Thank, thank you, Mr Speaker. In, in the recent in-year monitoring process, the Health Minister had bid for some £43 million in, towards inescapable pressures, but some £30 million were actually allocated. What discussion has the Finance Minister had with the First Minister regarding the pressures on the Health Service and the action emergency crisis in particular? Well, I have uh, regular discussions with, with the Health Minister, with uh, colleagues within the Executive, not least in terms of when I brought forward uh, my January monitoring paper, where of course I, I did uh, give £30 million in the Executive give £30 million to, to my colleague, the Health Minister, to relieve pressures that his department was under. Um, I am sure the member, uh, you know, I, I'm not satisfied that it was just £30 million. I think the pressures probably deserved more money. But in the situation that we find ourselves in, and trying to balance 
competing pressures that the executive faces. I, I didn't actually recall the Minister for Regional Development, for example, putting his hand up and offering the Minister for Health any additional funding. So we have to balance a whole range of different pressures. I'm glad that we've been able to give the Minister of Health £30 million uh, to spend on relieving pressures right across the health service, as we have done in previous uh, monitoring rounds. And I will continue to support the Minister for Health whenever he comes forward with bids to, to meet those inescapable pressures that he faces as a result of having years of mismanagement within the health service that he, of course, inherited just two years ago. Order members, that concludes questions to the Finance Minister. We now move